It's time for some more casually explained, specifically the carbon scale. Nuclear power can offset a lot of that. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. I'm engineering operations to emergency response. I don't think to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's see. Uh, this video is sponsored by Bill and Melinda Gates. Well, you seem kind of surprised by that too. So in the past year, I've really decided I want to start caring for the environment. So far, I'm up to okay. about 25 reusable bags above my closet. I don't know exactly what type of cardboard is recyclable, but I put it all in the blue bin anyway. And I always cut the six pack rings before I gently release them into my local wildlife reserve. Oh my. Well, everyone wants that. <laughs> And you keep your stretch limo constantly running, so you don't have to waste energy starting and stopping it, right? Fulfill their personal doing good quota. I often hear conversations that go, oh man, these paper straws suck compared to plastic ones. And the other person says, yeah, but they're better for the environment. And when I did some research, it turns out that, yeah. A so a lot of this gets really complicated, because not only how much, say, the waste product is, but you have to look into the manufacturing cost, levelized cost where the production facility is located, where they get their electricity from, where they get their water from, that they would need to operate the facility, all the transportation costs involved. It gets really, really complicated really, really fast. Paper straw is way more effective if you're looking to prevent people from weaponizing their cold brew. And no joke, plastic waste is a serious issue. But in terms of climate change and strictly carbon footprint, having an iced coffee with either a paper or... The other thing, everyone talks a lot about just carbon, which, you know, is an emission that needs to be controlled, but there's a whole bunch... It's not the only thing that needs to be controlled. You don't necessarily want to protect carbon at the expense of increasing pollution from mercury for instance it's you just gotta it doesn't tell you the whole story as far as industrial pollution is concerned or plastic straw actually has less impact than driving your car from one end of the drive through to the other and today in the context of climate change and bill and melinda gates is in <laughs> that is awesome a zero and just going up just like that your letter i want to look at the actual scale of things you might do or use every day and how scale. much it matters with regard to global carbon emission which is around 36 billion metric tons every year that's a lot so first up let's look at common consumables so we'll start right, with the paper straws. straw which takes about 1.38 grams of co2 to produce slightly less than a plastic straw which takes about 1.46 grams of co2 okay so we're talking strictly produce not necessarily transport from where they're produced to where you get the straws at I don't know. I think they're just grasping at straws here. For quick context, a metal straw takes about 217 grams, meaning you have to eliminate at least 150 sea turtles for it to be worth it. Metal straws, huh? Going back for a second, ahead of plastic straws, we have plastic bags coming in at around 20 grams of CO2. Sure. We have paper bags at around 80 grams, reusable polypropylene bags at 300 grams, and then cotton totes at around 3,500 grams or 3.5 like kilos. For quick context, this means you'd have to use a cotton bag about 150 times to be the CO2 equivalent to plastic bags and about 40 times to be the equivalent to paper bags. And as far as manufacturing, it's going to depend a lot where they get their electricity from. Because per kilowatt hour, a nuclear power plant, we're talking anywhere from 3 to 12 grams per kilowatt hour. Compare that to coal. And keep in mind this is levelized, so this includes construction costs plus operational costs over their entire lifespan. For coal, that's well over 820 grams. For natural gas, that's about 500. For solar, that's between 18 and 50. And for wind, that's between 7 and 15. So wind's closer to nuclear, but the main thing nuclear has over renewables is its longevity and its energy density so they're a lot bigger but you don't have to build them nearly as often to produce as much low carbon electricity because nuclear plants itself they don't have any carbon emissions all of the cost is with the is associated with construction and operation and maintenance not emissions Honestly, the part that I'm looking forward to is being on my deathbed and um, in general, but also the only thing in my will is going to be finish what I couldn't. And then each of my children gets a tote bag and how many more trips do they need to make to Safeway to complete my legacy? Really? Real joke is my children aren't inheriting anything. Nice. 
We have electrical devices which start to get more significant, leaving one 100 watt light bulb on for 24 hours, one kilogram of CO2, leaving a fridge running. I wonder if it means 100 watts worth of LEDs or if it means the old brightness back when people thought watts meant brightness and not energy consumed. I'm going to assume it's the real unit for 24 hours, two kilograms of CO2. Using a work computer and monitor for eight hours, two kilograms of CO2. Using a real computer with at least two graphics cards, three 1440p, 144 hertz monitors. Yeah, and like coolant systems in there that is basically a fridge, sure. Monitors and an RGB backlit keyboard to play Minecraft for 16 hours, 10 kilograms of CO2. Using an oven for two hours, 20 kilograms. Once again, another reason to have two graphics cards with a clear case so you can check on your roast. And again, we're just talking usage. Your phone, for instance, uses about 70 kilograms, but you're talking manufacturing and shipping, not, not the actual operating costs. But they're only at a, at a few watts, so we're not talking massive amounts of energy. And again, these numbers are very dependent on where you live, which is why there's such a wide range. Operating a heat pump is needed for 24 hours in a one-bedroom apartment. About 20 kilograms of CO2 as well, but again, I'm just repeating myself. In this ballpark, we also have driving your car each day at about 10 to 20 kilograms of CO2, that assuming you're the average American living the dream. If you add all this up and average it out, your everyday American is responsible for about 45 kilograms of CO2 emission per day, which is about the same as Canada or Australia, but double China and most of Europe. It is trailing behind Qatar, which is at 38, but it is in the top 10 on the full chart. And these numbers are a little different depending on the entire life cycle you take into account, but the overall point is US, Australia, Canada are usually towards the top. Well, things you do every day certainly add up over time. Even they can pale in comparison to the amount of resources it takes to manufacture things in the first place. Mm -hmm. The cell phone And some of it's transit, like one round trip from uh, New York City to LA can get you at over a thousand produces about 30 kilograms of co2 to manufacture which is the same as using it every day for about eight years and that probably depends because again the source i referenced had 70 but you could probably do one from 30 and you could probably do one for 70 and sh there's just a range like anything else a laptop produces about 250 kilograms of co2 to manufacture which is the same as using it every day for about three years this is also about the same as a five-hour one-way flight per person and then a large sedan a takes up okay. to 15 tons of co2 to manufacture which is the same as about three years of driving keep in mind that manufacturing most electric vehicles is about the same, sometimes slightly higher, but CO2 used for operation is much lower. This means in terms of carbon emissions, you could have one person who doesn't have heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, electricity, a cell phone, or even a sick gaming computer, but they- Just a banana. Well, that banana is going to give you a little bit of radiation dose, one banana equivalent dose, or 0.1 microsieverts. So not very much. And presumably not very much carbon to make a banana. Do drive 45 minutes. And yes, there's probably there's some carbon involved in transporting them from your grocery store. To work. And that would be about the same as someone who had all those things but worked from home and doesn't own a car. Which is the angle I go for when people find out I don't know how to drive. And now you might be thinking, <laughs> okay, well we need heating, we need cooling, we need refrigeration, we need a cell phone, we need a SIG gaming computer. You do. And nuclear power plants can help you get all of those things for relatively low carbon emissions. And many people need cars. So then what can your average person do that would actually matter? One suggestion I like is not to try to invest in nuclear power plants. Oh, it said average. To minimize everything because then you'll never succeed and feel guilty all the time but to ask yourself do i do anything in excess and can i cut down on that because similar to when you're trying to save money buying the drip coffee instead of the americano is going to make absolutely no difference if you're spending 500 dollars a month on premium snapchat and twitch donations <laughs> and there's i mean there's a few simple things like keeping your tires inflated driving more efficiently in the interest of that one big thing that nuclear companies have done, or even just big companies in general, have resulted in less flying and less business trips. This flying is very, flying's pretty carbon intensive. I know a lot of corporate travel things now get it measured in terms of carbon offsets. 
because that's money well spent. And in truth, some studies show that even if you lived in complete darkness in your mom's basement, eating only leftovers, which honestly sounds not too bad, by sheer heads. nature of what makes a first world country different from a third world country, it's almost impossible to get your carbon footprint below about 50% of the average for your country. And that brings us to the main premise of what Bill and Melinda Gates wanted to address swinging in their letter this the year, fences. which is swinging for the fences and taking big risks on big problems. Because while every individual can help in their own way, we also... Talking big risks, why not nuclear, nuclear power plants? Not safety risks, but I can understand the big financial risk because it takes a while for, for them to get built need solutions for global issues that can scale. As an example, the previously mentioned CO2 calculations for electrical devices is based on 65% of electricity coming from fossil fuels like in the US. Okay, I'm glad he clarified that because yeah, some of these numbers were higher than some of the sources that I'm familiar with, but there's a big, big range. So it's nice that he's addressing that. But if your country gets all of its electricity from renewables, then the CO2 emissions from your electronics is almost zero. That's renewables and nuclear power plants, especially if you're talking ones that are already existed, already operating, because the amount of emissions to maintain a nuclear power plant is really not very much. The vast majority of it is all that heavy equipment that's involved in building the thing. If you choose to have an electric car, then that too will also almost be zero. And as more energy comes from low emission sources, electric vehicles and devices become more and more efficient, making it not just an individual's responsibility to limit consumption and choose efficient products, but an international commitment to sustainable energy, CO2 mitigation, and providing aid to those afflicted or displaced okay, by the negative the outcomes part. of climate change. That's cool. And while I wanted to focus on climate specifically, in Bill and Melinda's letter, they go into more detail about not only climate change, but but other global problems of equal scale that require big risks and massive action for us to address. Now, the thing about electrification is it does require a lot of upfront costs, and but it only works if you have significant baseload energy in the form of nuclear plants supported by some renewables. But you run into intermittency issues with renewables and Batteries by itself just aren't there yet. In terms of long-term storage, we're talking days to weeks. That, that battery storage is still extremely expensive and unproven at scale and ultimately just not ready to replace nuclear. And I encourage you to take a look at the letter by clicking the link in the description where they discuss what they believe to be some of the most important global issues and how to approach them. By the way, um, a one gigawatt electric nuclear power plant over 60 years, which both of those numbers are kind of an underestimate, both in terms of power output and lifespans, avoids over 130 billion cheeseburgers worth of CO2, over 25 billion gallons of gas burn, over 10 million New York City to LA flights, and completely sets the lifetime emissions and production cost of over a billion smartphones. So that's the amount of scale that we're talking here. Again, this is, again, the carbon scale is an oversimplification, but, and really just an order of magnitude thing, but it does help put things into a little bit of a simplistic perspective, even though it gets complicated fast. And personally, for the 10 or 15 minutes it takes to read, I learned a lot I didn't know, and I think it's well worth the time. I like this one. This was silly, but also informative. Thanks so much for the recommendation, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.